Hey, welcome to the Publish, Promote, Profit podcast with me, Rob Kosberg. Every week, I interview thought leaders and experts who have used the book to grow their income and their impact. So tune in weekly for these interviews so you can learn how to use your own best-selling book and go from hunting for clients and opportunities to instead being the hunted. All right. Hey, welcome, everybody. Rob Kosberg here. I have another great episode because I have a great guest here for our Publish, Promote, Profit podcast, Mr. Ben Gay. You may have heard of him because he has sold tens of millions of copies of his book, his original book, The Closers, and that has become uh, very, very well known. He is a living legend, or at least uh, has been called that uh, in the sales world, (laughs) and uh, 50 plus years in professional selling, number one in every organization he's ever been a part of. And uh, I love the people that are your contemporaries, Ben, fellow sales legends uh, like Napoleon Hill, Earl Nightingale. These are people that you've met and known, Zig Ziglar, of course, and many other sales giants and uh, very, very excited to talk to you today. You're the founder and currently the executive director of the National Association of Professional Salespeople. So thank you for being on the podcast today. And I look forward to having a good conversation about sales, which is something that I love. Thank you, Rob. It's an honor to be with you. You know, we were obviously talking a, a few minutes ago, just before I started recording for the podcast. And I love talking to people that have been doing something at a very, very high level for a really long time because, you know, it's it's hard enough, Ben, to do something well for a short period of time, let alone to do something well for a long period of time. Let's start there. I mean, what do you credit your longevity to? What do you credit the ability to continue doing what you do at such a high level? Well, one, I enjoy it. And two, I, there's nothing else I can do. I, I got into got into big ticket selling yeah. uh, out of desperation. I literally decided I need to get another job. I was working for my father as a salesman, yeah. but he had made it clear to me that I wasn't going to inherit the business because he had two business partners. And he told me one day, they don't like you. Oh, so nice. It, <laughs> yeah. So had he died, I'd have been unemployed, and I figured I better start looking at some other options. And I got the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, September 15th, 1965, a Wednesday. And uh, it's funny how things stick in your mind when they're important to you. Yeah. And I went through the one ads. Standing beside the box, I got the thing out of it. I went through the one ads, and I got to the P's for psychologists and into if there are any Z's, I got there rather quickly. And I literally wasn't qualified to do any of them. I couldn't type. You know, I didn't. I was a high school graduate, right. elected president of my freshman class, by the way, in college. But unfortunately, the election and the inauguration were three weeks apart. So by the time they had the inauguration, I had dropped out. Uh, (laughs) If only they had been closer together. (laughs) Yeah, I think you should be elected and sworn in right then. But I truly didn't have any options. I thought, oh, this is grim. I was putting my wife through nursing school, and uh, which was taking up most of what I was making after taxes. So as I went to throw the paper in the trash can, I saw the next thing beyond employment was business opportunities. I didn't know what it was, but it sort of sounded interesting. So I started reading it. First or second ad I came to said, if you know anything about marketing plans and want to make more money, dial this number. So I dialed the number, talked to a gentleman named Bill Dempsey. I began interviewing him to see if he was worthy of me joining his business. And he said, he cut me off. He said, Mr. Gay, I'm not the man standing in a phone booth answering want ads. <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> nice. And I told him, yeah, I was about two blocks from his office, as it turned out, on West Peachtree Street in Atlanta. So I told him, he says, good, you, you can be here rather quickly. Be standing in front of my desk in 10 minutes or never dial this number again and hung up. Wow. So nine minutes later, I went skidding into his office, said to the receptionist, hi, my name's Ben Gay. And she said, we're expecting you. And a voice behind me, a a man who had been sitting there, laughed. And I turned around and he said, Ben Gay, is that your real name? Well, I'm used to Ben Gay jokes. I know all the jokes. I know all the responses. 
And I said, yeah, Ben Gates. I cut my hand. I said, what's your name? He said, Zig Ziglar. No kidding. Well, it turned out Zig, I'd never heard of him, and nobody else had either unless you were in his church or in the cookware business. Right. But he'd answered the same ad I had. So there were, I don't know what the circulation of the Atlanta Journal and Constitution was back then, but I'm guessing a half a million, I'm just making up a number. Two of us answered that ad. Wow. And we became the number one and number two salespeople in the company. It was a multi-level marketing company, Holiday Magic. Cosmetics was its name, the largest MLM in the world at the time, bigger wow. than Amway and Shackley combined. So that's how I entered high-level selling. I'd been doing well, and I was number one selling Krispy Kreme donuts when I was 10 years old. Uh, so, <laughs> Well, look, let's be honest. Krispy Kreme doesn't need a salesman to sell. <laughs> It does. You, you have to knock on the door. <laughs> they are so delicious. If someone came yeah. to my door right now with some, I, I'd buy everything he's got. <laughs> yeah. That was one of the tricks my father taught me. He said, stand where they can see what you have in your hand. <laughs> Krispy Kreme. Do- oh, and my little script was, I have your Krispy Kreme donuts. Now, would you like to buy them? Right. Or I have them. And they'd open the screen door and take them. <laughs> and I would say three dollars or whatever it was for a dozen donuts. Nice. And uh, but but I won a bright red Columbia bicycle doing that, and I was sort of hooked. No kidding. That's great. You met Zig Ziglar during your job interview. What an incredible! And yeah. I guess you guys have stayed in touch. I mean, obviously he's passed now, but but I guess you yeah. stayed in touch for many many years, right? Yeah, he was uh, became a, a good friend and yeah. was a, an early. Zig was eighteen years older than I was. He was yeah. in the Navy the day I was born. Wow! So he he was sort of a father figure. Although two years later, I won a national sales contest. First prize was a mystery prize. Second prize was a Rolls Royce. Then I think a Lincoln and a Thunderbird, something like that. And I won the mystery prize. So they flew me to California. And uh, William Penn Patrick, the owner of the company, took me out to lunch. And I said, what's the mystery prize? He said, you're going to be president of the company. <laughs> what? I said, yeah, I was 25 years old. I said, why? Well, one, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and two, why was that a mystery prize? And he said, because if whoever won it was somebody I didn't like, I would have changed the prize. <laughs> nice. So, yeah, clever. So Zig and I used to kid about it. If I was having an especially rough day, I was running a big company that was quickly becoming international with subsidiaries, et cetera. I was having a rough day and happened to be talking to Zig. You say, Zig, here's the deal. Bring me the keys to the Rolls Royce and I will give you the keys to the building. He said, oh, no, you won fair and square. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's great. So Zig took second place and he got the rolls, huh? <laughs> yeah. And very few headaches. Wow. He just kept walking around telling his stories and so on. And I was sweating bullets trying to learn how to run a company. How interesting. Now, what, what was that company selling at that time? Cosmetics was the first. Oh, so that was still the what, cosmetics company. Yeah, that was the cosmetic company when I joined it. And then we had subsidiaries rather quickly, Stay Power, Motor Oil Additives, Bob Cummings, yeah. Vitamins, Ameriprise, Home Care Cleaning Products. But they all had exactly the same marketing plans, same finances to get in and, yeah. and so on. So it was really, you just had to remember when you were standing in front of a few thousand people, which product you were talking about. Yeah. I'd yeah. carry a note with yeah. me that said Holiday Magic, you know, or <laughs> Stay Power or whatever. But uh, it, it was uh, interesting times, the wild west of multiple-level marketing. Yes, yes. So interesting. Now, obviously, you're not a contemporary of Napoleon Hill. Probably many people listening or watching this podcast have read Think and Grow Rich or one of his many books. What's your connection? How did you know him, meet him? You know, he obviously, there it is. I mean, legend, right? Signed. Very nice. Very nice. I love it. I love it. Nothing like a signed book by Napoleon Hill. (laughs) Yeah. So what's the connection? How, Uh, How did you get to know him? What was he like in real life? When we met, he was 84 and I was 25. Wow. So he was biologically old enough to be my great grandfather. Yes. And he was in the, I didn't know he was there. He was in the building. We had famous people wandering around all the time. So yeah. no one felt the need to run in and say Napoleon Hill was here. But uh, 
he had named William Penn Patrick one of the five greatest living Americans or something like that in a book and was there to present Bill Patrick with the book and a plaque and so on. Wow. And uh, on the way out, I found out later, Bill Patrick said, I want you to meet a young man. I think you could do him some good. And while they were walking the length of the building, Bill's office was in the back, mine was in the front, he struck a deal with it. Uh, you remember Rodney Dangerfield, the old comedian? Of course, said loved that, him. Uh, yeah. He said that his family tied a pork chop around his neck so the dog would play with him. Right. Well, Bill Patrick tied a $50,000 check around my neck so Dr. Hill would be my friend. Wow. And in <laughs> today's money, that's, you know, four hundred, four hundred fifty thousand wow. dollars And uh, and he, he said, this guy, he's doing a great job. But Bill knew the politics. He said, I know he has moments when he would like to ask me a question, but he doesn't want to reveal to me, Bill Patrick, that he doesn't know the answer or that he's scared out of his mind (laughs) or whatever. So you're to be the one in the middle. And uh, there was a knock on my door and I looked up and there was Bill Patrick and a little old man standing uh, next to him on a leaning on a cane. And being a Southerner, I didn't know who he was. He didn't look like, you know, it wasn't that high collar picture you see all the time. Yeah. By this time, he was an old guy. Yeah. And uh, so I had jumped up being a Southerner to shake his hand. I said, hi, I'm Ben Gay. I'm waiting for his name. And Bill Patrick said, Ben, that's Dr. Napoleon Hill. I said, oh, how are you? And he said, call me Nappy. <laughs> and that became the first of our ongoing fights. We were together two and a half, almost three years before he died. I refused to call him Nappy. I've never said the word until he died. No then kidding. I would tell the story. But yeah, I, I'm. you're 84, I'm 25. That makes you at least Mr. Hill. Yeah. And if yeah. you're a doctor, it makes you Dr. Hill. You know, when I was growing up, teachers didn't have first names. Right. right. They were Mr. or Mrs. or Ms. or whatever. And uh, so Bill told me the deal. And he said, and I promise you, Dr. Hill has sworn that uh, anything you tell him will not uh, come to me. He'll tell you what he thinks, but that's where it stops. Mm. So he didn't use the word, but my mother was a Catholic, and it sounded to me like a Catholic priest. Like yeah, really, confessional. <laughs> yeah, I have somebody I can talk to. <laughs> so it. that's how we started our relationship. And uh, he used to stay at the house. We had the uh, Dr. Hill room in my office, which was a big conference table. To my left was obviously a chair at the end. That was Dr. Hill's chair. And no one sat in it if he was in town. And no one sat in it unless the room had no other chairs for some yeah. meeting. Then with they'd say, is it okay if I sit here? Nice. He'd sit down. So he was an older, he wasn't feeble mentally, he was very sharp, but he was an older guy. And uh, we didn't sit around one of my partners. We have a thing called The Last Protégé, which is based on I am the last protégé of Dr. Hill. Uh, And when we first started working together, Mark Harris said to me, now, did he give you lessons? And I thought, oh, they're thinking about student, teacher, grasshopper, you know, so on. What Dr. Hill did was sit in my office when he was in town and write on the legal pad, probably writing some book we've all since read, and uh, listen. And we'd go to lunch and dinner. We already had breakfast together up at the house, and he would listen. And the rule, it wasn't a rule, but I watched how he worked. If other people in the room, he never said anything to me other than the shallowest social stuff. You know, how are you today? Yeah. But when everybody got up and left and the door between my secretary and me clicked, if his head popped up, he had something he wanted to discuss with me from the session he had just heard. Mm. And that would be the only time it would be discussed in private, just the two of us. So it was really wonderful. It was like having a my great grandfather or my grandfather in the office with me all the time Wow! and uh, could ask him anything. And I even tested the theory. They, before I got to the home office, a group of people had tried uh, people who were there when Bill started the company, tried a coup. They walked in his office one day and said, uh, we're going to take three quarters of the company. Well, everybody's going to have 25% of the company. You get to keep 25. We're going to take 25. And so on. Bill said, well, let me think it over. 
come up to the house tonight for dinner. And when they came up to the house, all of the Holiday Magic employees were there. I don't know how many it was in those days, probably 50 or something. And when they walked in these big double doors, Bill was sitting at the far end of the dining room table. And he said, gentlemen, welcome to the Last Supper. <laughs> <laughs> and he sent one of them to Mexico, one to Canada, and one to explore international opportunities. Some, <laughs> what it really was was get them out of town, right, right, and and bust up a little click. Well, Bill couldn't tell you that story without getting you know veins in the neck. I mean, it, it would make him mad years sure. later, even though he he since become refriended one of them, Bill Bailey of Best Line. And uh, they had become buddies. So I told Dr. I wrote a letter to Bill. Bill, I'm telling uh, Dr. Hill that a bunch of us are going to try and take over the company from you. It's not true and so on. But I want to test this vow of silence. I had it sealed in the art department with a wax seal. And I had it put in his secretary's desk, Marion McGinnis. I said, Marion, if you should ever hear, hear Bill explode while Dr. Hill is in there with him or when I'm in there with him or whatever, have this hand this letter to Bill because it will tell him you've been tricked. Yeah. You know, it didn't happen. So I went to Dr. Hill and said, uh, there's a group of us. We're really doing all the work. He's just wandering around taking vows. And we're going to demand 75% of the company. And so on. I laid out exactly what the first group had really tried. And Dr. Hill listens and he said, uh, don't do it. It's a very bad idea. Don't do it. You have a bright future here and blah, blah, blah. Don't do it. And I said, well, it's just between you and me. And he said, yeah, absolutely. Dr. Hill died. Bill Patrick died in a plane crash. The company finally went under. I, I had left long before then. And to my knowledge, when they hauled Marion McGinnis's desk out of the office and cleared out the office, that letter was still in the top drawer. Yeah. Dr. Hill never said a word to Bill Patrick about it, even oh, though cool. Bill had paid him the first year. Yeah. Oh, cute story. At the end of the first year, I said, Dr. Hill said a couple of things to me, and I said, Bill Patrick, Dr. Hill is hinting that, and I knew what he paid him because I signed the checks. It came to me later that day, $50,000. And uh, I said, Dr. Hill is hinting that uh, he'd like to be paid to another year. What do you think? He said, well, it's totally up to you. It's your money. And I, for a second, I thought, my money because I'm president of the company. Then it dawned on me he meant my money. <laughs> so I wrote Dr. Hill a check for $50,000. Wow. We entered the second year. And I was telling somebody that story the other day, and it dawned on me he died two and a half years after we met, and I couldn't remember if I'd paid him for the third year. Because if I had, the, the Napoleon Hill estate owes me <laughs> about $25,000. <laughs> well, plus interest. <laughs> plus interest. Point, at this point. Yeah. <laughs> What a great story. So, uh, you know, very, very interesting. Obviously, you're around him. You knew of his books, famous personality. I'm sure you read most of, if not everything. Did any of that play into you writing your first book? And how much later was it before you actually wrote your first book? Well, the years. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Hill was the first person I ever met who was a published author. Interesting. <laughs> My parents might have had some friends that were poets or something, you know, yeah. vanity books, but a real book. He was the first person I ever met. Now, with modern publishing techniques, I don't know anyone who hasn't written a book. <laughs> well, I know plenty still. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the book business. I'm still quite, trying to get them to write. <laughs> yeah. I, it's not quite as unique as That's it used true. to be. It's not. Say that way. So, uh, yeah, I was fascinated by it. I, one day he came into our living room. I think it was the first time he was at the house, walked in the living room, and my wife had taken a copy of Think and Grow Rich and put it strategically on the coffee table. Yeah. Only book in the living room. Sort of like this is what the family does every night. We sit around and read <laughs> yeah, book. yeah, yeah. Instead of the Bible, we read Think and Grow yeah. Rich. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Dr. Hill, you know, oh, look. Oh, look. <laughs> There's a copy of Think and Grow Rich. I said, how to struggling for something to make up for what was frankly an awkward moment. I said, uh, how does it feel to have written, back then they used to say it was second only to the Bible. I don't know if that was true then or not, or it certainly isn't now, but whatever. Yeah. Second only to the Bible. How does it feel to have written one of the best-selling books ever? And he said, best-selling, least read. 
<laughs> Interesting. One of his frustrations was that, you know, everybody talked about it. He said, I can talk to somebody five minutes and know whether they've read it or not. Mm-hmm. He said the vast majority haven't. This book I showed you a minute ago, Rob, is yeah. uh, bright red on this side, bright red on this side, bleached out on the spine. Yeah. A friend of mine found this at a garage sale a couple of years ago for 50 cents. No kidding. And yeah, and opened it up. Fortunately, she just opened the cover and saw it was written to Mrs. Grace Dixon with best wishes, Napoleon Hill. Wow. Well, you you and I have been in the business long enough. I, I can tell you the whole story just looking at that. Yeah. Grace Dixon, whoever she was, heard Dr. Hill was coming to fill in the blank, paid probably something to see him, uh, sat in the audience. He talked and he did the altar call and people got in line to buy the books and yeah. then they got in line to uh, have them signed. And then she took it home and put it in her bookcase. And yep. there it sat for 75 years. Wow. Because when Sandra Nomer gave me the book and I went to open it, I stopped because it was obvious the spine had never been cracked. Wow. How so it that? still had the only time that book has been opened was when Dr. Hill opened the front cover to sign it. Yeah. Understandable then uh, the frustrations that he had over that, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so me, the, the uh, closers t- came along in the late seventies, okay, and uh, for for an entirely different reason. And uh, first of all, I didn't write the first draft of what we now call Part One. It was just called the Closers. I was I had invented the call center business, and discovered rather quickly that ninety six percent of the people in nineteen seventy six didn't know that an eight hundred number was toll free or free to them. Mm. And it didn't appear in any ads anywhere. So I wrote a series of letters to people who were running ads without an 800 number telling their sales would go up and blah, blah, blah. And everybody in the company was assi- was given a, a one of those pens, what do you call them, the one artist used to cut clippings out and yeah. stuff. Yeah. It was given one of those. And so anytime you see an ad that doesn't have uh, an 800 number in it, which is all of them, <laughs> uh, clip it out, send it to word process, and they'll send out the series of letters. Well, one day I'm looking in the Wall Street Journal uh, at some want ads, and I saw a poorly written ad that had the word closers or closing in it. And I wasn't sure what it was, but w- what it really didn't have was an 800 number. So I took my pen knife, is what they're called. I yeah, took yeah, my yeah. pen knife, cut yeah. out the ad, sent it to word process, and just as I was sending it, I thought, because it asked, I think, fourteen ninety five for whatever they were selling. I thought, that may be a book about selling. I can't tell. I clipped my $14.95 check to, check to it, sent it to them. I forgot about it. Three weeks later, this package arrived. It looked like something you might get if your kid had been host- taken hostage, and this was the, <laughs> the ransom letter. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Horrible. Crayon on the envelope. So I opened it up. And there was this ratty little book called The Closers, poorly uh, bound. When I got it out and flipped the pages, like you do with a book, pages shot all over my office. It had been bound so poorly. Yeah. So I thought, oh, I've been cheated again. So I gathered up all the pages and went to throw them in the trash. And then being cheap, and there weren't movies on all the airplanes yet. We didn't have cell phones and so on. And I was about to go to New York. I decided to keep it, put it in my briefcase glanced through it in the plane, and I already had a plot. I was going to leave it in the back of the seat in front of me and let them throw it out. And I started flipping through the pages after I got them reassembled, and I it was like I'd found the Dead Sea Scrolls <laughs> of selling. The writing was poor. It was misspelled. There were entire sentences missing. I don't know where they went, but they just weren't there. You could tell <laughs> it was supposed to go to another thought. So, so, but I had stumbled onto something. So I went when we plane got to LaGuardia, I think it was, I went to the pay phone. Your younger listeners, it was a phone on a wall <laughs> and you put money in it. <laughs> <laughs> you put change in it. <laughs> yeah. I went to the pay phone. And uh, dialed the number in the book. And when I said, I said, hi, uh, I just finished reading The Closers and I want to talk to somebody. And I said, well, Mr. Gay, how are you? This is before caller ID. Uh, the only thing around in those days was, was <laughs> candid camera. You're the you only know, one who ordered of, it, huh? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm looking for that. I said, I didn't give you my name. He said, well, you just said you read The Closers. He said, we printed 500 copies. There's a story behind that I won't bore you with, but we printed 500 copies, and uh, 
We put one ad in the Wall Street Journal one day, and we sold one book. <laughs> so if you've read The Closers, your name is Ben Gay, and you're from Placerville, California. Wow. I said, how many more of these do you have? And he said, like I said, we printed 500. We sold one. I don't have to go count them. We have 499. I said, I'll take them. So I took them just to, to I was going to tell people the story. It's a horrible book. Pages are upside down. Ignore that and uh, give them out and say, if you're smart enough to dig through them, you'll find gold in here. And they, they everybody took one in the home office. That was probably 20 books of, to the salespeople. And then they started coming up a week or two later. Bob in Chicago would like a couple of those. And pretty quick, the 500 were gone. So And they were saying, how do we get more? So I called them back, negotiated the publishing, editing, rewriting rights to the book, and turned it into the best-selling book on selling ever written, wow. 10 and a half million copies, when we quit counting 25 years ago. Incredible. What a story. I love that. Yeah. Well, even on the book, most people don't notice it, but on the book, it says Ben Gay the Third editor. Yeah. yeah. And then inside, I state who I was told wrote it. I since met him, and he's not bright enough to have written it. So I, I don't know who wrote it, and I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> that is great. What a great story. I mean, uh, yeah. you found some incredible content, and you did something amazing with it. So let's change gears for just a minute. What are some of the most amazing things that have happened? You've ma obviously made a ton of money from the book. But besides mm -hmm. that, what are some of the most amazing things that have occurred how your name has grown, your authority, your credibility using the book. Talk to me about uh, those kinds of things. I call the closers, and there's five books in the series and seven more being written as we speak where I'm co-authoring on different subjects. Nice. The closers for real estate people or the yeah. closers for, you know, that's that type sure. of thing. Not unlike Chicken Soup for the Soul. Sure. And uh, the thing that's been for me, it's, it's a one and a half pound business card. Mm. I can go into any sales office in the world. And if I've got that book in my hand, there's someone there, if not all of them, there's someone there who knows what it is. Right. I walk to, I, I, it's a trick. I do walk through the county fair through all the booths and I carry the closers like this in front of me. And I can tell who the salespeople are. Yeah, people, yeah, yeah. They'll stop talking. Look, and usually I'll wear my Ben Gay. Well, if you can see it, my Ben Gay the closer <laughs> shirt. Right, I don't, right. I don't leave it to chance. <laughs> so it's open doors for me all over the world. It's now in twenty six languages. Mm. It's just, it's been a, a game. If that's all I did was do that, I'd be in in fine shape. Yeah. But the trick was, I had to be doing something else for it to happen. If I hadn't invented the call center industry, I wouldn't have been looking for ads that didn't have eight hundred numbers. Right. You know so. So it, it all comes together, and that, but it gets you into things. I was attitude coach for the astronauts, Apollo 15, 16, and 17. That was due to running the big cosmetic company and the launch test supervisor, supervisor of the manned space program. His wife was a holiday girl, like an Avon lady. Yeah. And that got me into the launch of Apollo 14 and meet everybody else and became their attitude coach and put some together some programs. Some, but it all came in that case because I answered a little ad in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Wow. Take out that ad. Only They only ran that thing one or two days. Yeah. Take out that ad, you and I wouldn't be talking. How about Take that? out that ad, there wouldn't be a closers. Yeah. yeah. So it all ties together. And since you're a book fan, it also got me into uh, teaching at San Quentin for five years, a, cor a course called People Builders. And that got me an invitation, not that it was a great honor, but one of the lieutenants came to me one day and said, Mr. Gay, uh, there's somebody who wants to meet you. He's fascinated by the class. And I said, well, send him down. He said, no, this one can't come down. <laughs> oh. uh, well, this one was Charlie Manson. Oh, my gosh. Who was, who was sitting in the adjustment center. But oddly enough, his cell the only thing he could see out across the gun port uh, was a little window. And the only thing he could see through that, like it was a gun sight, was the door that I came in every Friday night and left every Saturday morning. And I always with a crowd around me and, and so on. And he wanted to know who's that guy. I think right. he was jealous. 
Right. So I, long story somewhat shorter, we set up meet, which turned into three meetings, totally nine hours in his cell. But when I walked in, two bunk cell, top bunk was sort of like a shelf. No one wanted to sleep with Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> they said they, they don't mind being in the cell with Charlie, but they don't want to go to sleep with Charlie. Yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> so he, he was single bunked in the cell. I walk in on the top shelf. There were a few little things lying around, but there was one book, How to Win Friends and Influence People oh by Dale gosh, Carnegie. Oh, you kidding me. And I, yeah, I looked around <laughs> the cell for the other books. It was the only book he had. And I said, Charlie, that's a fascinating book selection. He said, it's my Bible. I couldn't have built the Manson family without it. Wow, that's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, but wow. but it's so true about a lot of things. You can read the closers and figure yeah. out how to cheat somebody. Yeah, or you yeah, can you, can, the- you can turn it to evil, can't you? Sure. Yeah. Sure, and, can- and he did. Wow. I could not have built the Manson family without that book. Wow. <laughs> I went, whoa. <laughs> wow. Ben, it, uh, just intriguing stories. I love it. So tell me, what are you working on right now? You, you talked about four other books and where can we send people? Where best to find out some more information about you or, or maybe partner with you on a project or have you come and speak if you're still doing that? Uh, tell me a little bit about well, that. Now, now that the hotels are opening up, the yeah. offers are starting to come in. Yeah. If they want to reach me, You go to www.bfg3.com. That's Benjamin Franklin Gay the Third BFG3. If they'd like to get the books with special pricing and free shipping, yeah, they go to stores.ebay.com forward slash Ronzoni Books. R O N Z O N E Books. B O O K S. Love it. Interesting story. You know, how can they sell it for less than I do and have free shipping? My wife, Gigi's maiden name was Ronzoni. She owns Ronzoni Books. And the answer is she goes in the warehouse and steals inventory from me, (laughs) sells it on that site, (laughs) then brings it back to me for signing. I still have to sign them even though she stole I was going to say, will you sign the books? Because, you know, that people want that. Yeah, I sign sign and date them all. And then uh, she slips them into our shipping thing. So we pay to ship the book she stole that I signed. So <laughs> well, if you don't mind, it sounds deal, like a money mind, losing proposition, Ben. <laughs> for me, yeah, yeah. If you don't mind dealing with an embezzler, <laughs> go to stores.ebay.com forward slash Ronzoni Books, and they'll get them right out to you. Well, it sounds like Gigi is a closer. I like her already. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Ben, so good talking to you today. I just love your stories. I want to learn more. We need to do like a part two of this at some point. And, uh, and Whenever I wanna, you're ready. I wanted to ask about Earl Nightingale and others, so there's, uh, there's more. And, of course, I'm going to get some of your books, uh, and I want your signature, so I'm going to buy them from Gigi. But thank you. <laughs> thank you for being on the podcast today. Great, great, great to have you on. Well, my pleasure. Anytime I can be of service, just shoot me an email and we'll do it. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. It's an honor.